Hello and welcome to the Brutal Hiring Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. So today's topic is trainer education, and we're going to discuss how to renew training ideas. So it's very common for trainers that um, with all of the other responsibilities we have going on, that we became, can become stale in our training ideas and strategies. So without even realizing it, we tend to kind of commonly pick the same exercises. So you might know a library of 100 exercises, meaning you can think of 100 good exercises in your head, but you're commonly going to stay with maybe a selection of, say, 20 that you use most often. And it's not that that's a bad thing. Uh, you do want to teach what you know. <laughs> so if you understand those 20 very well, you can teach them very well, and they're very complete in terms of, a, like, say you do full body training, and you know, like, a couple good variations of squats, a couple good deadlifts, a couple good, like, unilateral lower body movements. So, like, you have everything kind of covered, you know, push, pull, legs, core, blah, 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 blah. So let's just say it's, like, 20 exercises. If the, If you know those well and you can execute them well, then those are the ones you want to stay with most commonly. That makes sense. But at the same time, you always want to be deciding or kind of being aware of, are these 20 always the best? Maybe I need to renew my knowledge. Maybe I need to review them. Maybe there's some better idea that came out. Or maybe I have a new type of clientele. So maybe I have a client that isn't quite like my old client, so therefore maybe they need a new set of exercises. But there should always be some type of attention paid to whether what you're doing is continually the best. So at one time, it might have been the best, but you're a new person, maybe you have new clients, maybe you're at a new gym, da 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 There's new stuff that comes into life. Therefore, we sometimes we have to renew our training knowledge and strategies. So for myself, for example, as I've done group training before, I do one-on-one -on -one training now, I've done training for all age levels, literally, I've trained like kindergarten kids uh, with physical acti activities, and I've trained uh, all the way up into like 70 and 80 year olds, and I've even trained special needs. So th with all of that changing, um, with all the changes to who those people were that I was training, I would have had to have a different set of kind of exercises and strategies. So Anybody who's ever done a group class versus in one-on-one, you'll know immediately that things are different. <laughs> so there are some training strategies that are available to you when you're on one-on-one that are not available in a group. And there are some ideas that work well in a group that would be really weird and awkward to do as a one-on-one. -on -one. So it makes sense that with new uh, people or new situations that sometimes our knowledge needs to be renewed. So... Uh, just rambled on and on about something that you probably already recognized was necessary. <laughs> so, uh, but um, one of the best ways and what I want to talk about in this podcast to refresh your ideas and to continue to bring in new excitement to your training uh, with clients is to do that in your own training and with self-education. So you always, always, always want to be trying to teach yourself. You want to try to be learning things. When you teach yourself new movements or exercises or strategies, or when you read about them in a book or go to a seminar or stuff like that, like since this is your passion, if you're a trainer, you should be passionate about training. <laughs> so when you get a presented something that's a new, fun piece of information in something you're passionate about, you can't help but share that with people. So if you're focusing on trying to increase your own knowledge for your own goals, that'll automatically make it to where you'll just start sharing it with your clients because you'll just be excited. Like, oh man, you got to try this thing. I did this and da 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 You know, so if you're constantly trying to push yourself towards your own goals, trying to continue to learn what you need to move yourself forward, that'll help you move your clients forward. So that's what I think is the number one thing is Instead of me saying, oh, what else is out there? Let me look at this and this. Or let me read this arbitrary book of 10 exercises. And maybe out of those 10 exercises, you don't even, like, use half of them. You know, that doesn't work well. You have to do something that's for you. So education for yourself. And that's going to then push it into clients because it's natural. 
It's absolutely natural that anything we get excited about for ourselves, we're going to try to tell other people. So, for example, say that um, there's a clinic coming up on Olympic weightlifting, but you do not do Olympic weightlifting. It's not a bad idea to go check it out if you have interest. I'm not saying don't do that. Um, you know, if you're interested, great. But if you're like, oh, there's an Olympic lifting clinic nearby, I don't really like Olympic lifting. I don't do it in my training, and I don't really have any clients, but eh, maybe I'll pay the money and I'll go do it. Ugh. You know, that's kind of like a 50-50 whether that's going to work out. Maybe you'll go there, be excited, it'll seem something interesting, and now all of a sudden you have a renewed passion, or like a, a new passion, not renewed, but brand new. Um, but it's also just as likely as you'll go there, and you're like, yeah, no wonder I don't like this, blah, blah, blah. not really exciting. You'll come home from it, not really be that fired up about it, so it doesn't kind of resonate. So we want to try to renew our knowledge with things that are naturally interesting to us. So a couple examples I have for mine. Uh, I've been to a lot of uh, clinics and seminars uh, when they've been available to me when I had the finances. So that these aren't going to be something you can necessarily do all the time. But when you can, they're extremely helpful to have. So I went to a uh, clinic held by uh, Tom Barry from Westside Barbell. He's kind of like the main assistant to Louis Simmons at this point. And he does a lot of uh, training on his own. He's, a, he's, a, he's in his own right a very good trainer. So, um, but he's kind of applying Louis Simmons conjugate method, uh, methods, um, from the West Side Barbell kind of system. So I went to one of their clinics and it was, uh, Tom Berry and John Quint. John Quint does the uh, physical rehab and physical therapy for a lot of people on West Side Barbell. And it was super fun. It was really exciting. It was actually a seminar for call, uh, high school football coaches. And I got to go because of a friend of a friend kind of thing. And, um, so I got to go. It was fun. They showed a bunch of like prehab therapies for shoulder health and whatnot. And at the time, I had a couple of clients that had shoulder problems. I've had a whole ton of shoulder injuries myself. So it was fun to learn and get a feel for those techniques and see how good they felt. Um, we also talked about training structures for athletes. Now, often a lot of what they were talking about was group style structures. And I do one on one training, but it was still really good information. Excuse me for there. Sorry about that. Excuse me. Um, it was really good information in the sense that it gave an idea for a workout structure that I could use and implement. So maybe they were implementing it with groups, but I was actually able to kind of still apply that to individual one on one training. So, for example, the technique I was kind of using at the time was to set up a push pull legs type workout. And it was actually, uh, we did the legs first, and then you would switch to push and then pull. And that was kind of the, the sequence. So what we did is I would try to set it up within a very small area in the sense that uh, it would just be on maybe one squat rack. So on the inside back edge of the squat rack, we would be doing some type of squatting. Then maybe on the front side, outside, we would do like overhead presses. And then they would use that overhead press bar and maybe do like inverted pull-ups or some odd craziness. But we were trying to figure out somehow how to kind of do a push-pull legs on of just one squat rack. And it made it to where it was uh, able to do a circuit. We were able to have access to the equipment in the sense of like, even in a busy gym, I just needed one space rather than trying to use a bunch of different pieces of equipment. So we would set up a structure like that. We would do uh, warm-ups with very low reps, like maybe just three to five rep warm-ups. And it was just to kind of refine the technique real fast. Then all of a sudden we'd do some explosive warm-ups, meaning that they might only be at 50 to 60 to 70 percent of their one rep max of what, or like what a heavy, really heavy weight would be for them for that exercise. So you don't have to actually know the percentages. Just say, okay, this is something that they can easily move for 15 or 20 reps, but I'm going to have them move it for five reps really aggressively very fast. And that actually built some explosiveness, kind of woke up the nervous system. Then we would add a bunch of weight. We would do it for strength for like, say, three to five reps, really freaking heavy. But they already were warmed up with the technique work. They got the explosivity to warm up the nervous system. They then went into strength work. Then we dropped the weight back down in the mid-range, kind of like maybe 70, 80 percent. And they did muscle manipulation. So maybe for that client, if they wanted muscular endurance, we do sets of 40 to 60 seconds uh, or even 60 plus. 
if they wanted mus muscle building, we would do sets of anywhere from, like, say, 20 to 40 seconds. So it was kind of fun in the sense to where you created this circuit. It was all full body in one area. You used the same exercises throughout the whole thing. You did technique warm-up, explosive-style warm-ups, strength-based, and muscle manipulation. And you can get a full body workout, crush the person, have a lot of fun. And it was just kind of like I took that structure, push-pull legs, with those sets and rep schemes, and then each week you would just plug in different exercises. So if last week you did maybe a barbell military press, maybe this time we did hex bar overhead presses. So they had more of a neutral grip. Then once we did that, like maybe the next time we would come in and we would try like a, a banded football bar, maybe a 60 degree incline press. So it was still kind of like an inclined, but it was a different grip, different stimulus by having bands on it, you know, versus like the previous two weeks, maybe we didn't have bands. Maybe we, next time we'd cycle through the same three exercises, but this time we'd add chains. But it was so, it was really fun because I had this consistent structure, but the exciting part was applying new exercises. And you can have it be done the other way, where you can have the exact same exercise you repeat every week, but you change the structure each week. So maybe one week I show the person just how to do it regularly. Maybe the next week we do bands from the bottom. Next week, bands from the top. Next week we do chains. You just try to make some variety around a consistency. And that's a really helpful way to kind of make sense of organizing your structure. And it can create creativity because you have a framework of that consistency. So there's something that's consistent saying, okay, I need to make this, I need to make something fit into this box. And then the creativity is finding the something. If you don't have a box and you don't know what the something is, it kind of can be haphazard or kind of wishy-washy as to what it might be each week. And you tend to fall into the same things. So for each month, you can challenge yourself and pick a new box, pick a new training structure, for example. And then that month, try to find a bunch of weird exercises that fit into that structure. Maybe the next month, you pick a consistent exercise, and you vary the structure that you use with that exercise. So that's the idea of sometimes going to clinics and seminars, is you get presented all this new information that excites you and bring forth uh, different ideas, different structures, different quote-unquote boxes, that you can then learn how to fit your clients into, fit your knowledge into. So that's a lot of fun. The other examples we have would be very common, but uh, are books. You can learn a lot from books. So I recently bought a powerlifting book by Boris Shako, who's uh, arguably, well, not even arguably, he's literally uh, one of the best strength coaches ever. Um, and he came up with a powerlifting book, and it, that book is freaking awesome. And um, one of the things I learned from the book was that the majority of what I was doing was kind of right. So that kind of made me feel good. Um, compared to like his opinion too. Um, but it was fun to see like where his emphasis were for different things versus mine. How we maybe like uh, had the same idea, but we applied or we approached it in how we um, kind of addressed that idea, I guess, uh, was a little bit different. So maybe some of his exercise choices were different than mine. Um, maybe like the way I might like to prioritize certain things was a little bit of a different order. So it was fun to see where his order was and why, and that I could compare and contrast like my beliefs. And sometimes there's ways for him to be right. And there's ways for me to be right. And how to so deal with the fact that we might work with different type of clientele. So if he's always working with athletes who want to be competitive and they're always in their kind of prime health and prime abilities, that's going to have a different set of focal points or a different order of focal points. Uh, whereas if I'm working with somebody who's in their 40s and 50s, they do want to get strong, but we have mobility issues, joint issues, we have other issues before we can really address strength primarily. So we might have the exact same things that we want to address, but there might need to be addressed in a different order. So that's fun because it presents you with new information. And then you can compare it to what you do, compare and contrast, and learn some. So the other thing is we have is we have social media nowadays. So you have YouTube resources. Like one of my favorite is Josh Bryant um, from Jailhouse Strong, I believe. Is, is, I think his YouTube channel is Josh Bryant. And that's B-R-Y-A-N-T. And uh, he has a ton of really great bodybuilding technique style videos that are just really fun, exciting bodybuilding ideas. 
So he might present you uh, a box. So you can listen to, like, watch one of his videos, and it might be a training structure for a 30-minute workout. And you look at the video, you see how he does it, and you realize, man, I love this idea, but I don't have that machine he used. So I wonder what I can do as an alternative. So it gets you thinking, it gets you being creative. So that's what you want to do is try to focus on self-education. If you're always trying to educate yourself, you will automatically end up educating your clients and doing new things because it's your passion and you're going to share your passions. So those are the main resources that I think are on the cheapish end and they're easy to add into regular life. So seminars, clinics, books, YouTube, Instagram, stuff like that. So for example, on Instagram, you can follow someone and that way on your home page, maybe they make a post that day of some cool exercises. All of a sudden it just shows up automatically. You didn't have to really look for it. It's just kind of like a random reminder of fun things. So that's a great way to do it. So for example, I follow Josh Bryant on Instagram. So I follow a bunch of other people like John Quint and some of these other people I mentioned before. Um, I follow them on Instagram. And then anytime I check in on Instagram to either check my own business stuff or check for friends or even check for them, their information pops up, and I'll look at it and go, oh, that's cool. I need to do that, and I'll save the post. So, and I'll look at it later, maybe read it more in detail, figure out how I can use it for clients. In the world of YouTube, you have subscriptions. So you can get subscriptions and reminders now. They make it, like, so crazy. But um, you can get subscriptions and reminders of the people that you want to learn from. So, again, if they create a new video, you can get an email. Excuse me. Damn, uh, you can get an email and it can alert you when they put up something brand new or you can just subscribe to them but not have the alerts and then whenever you check in on YouTube, you would go to your subscriptions page and you could see um, what has been the most recent things that the people you've subscribed to has posted. So you can get an email reminder exactly when it's posted or you can just do the subscriptions and check in whenever you want to check in. So it kind of depends on uh, probably how busy your email already is. So if you're already a pretty busy email, you're not going to want to get more emails. Um, then with books, you can just make a schedule or a note to every every month buy a new book. So for business, I have a subscription to Audible, so the Audible app, audio books on my phone. And every month, it basically forces you to buy a book because you get a quote-unquote free credit every month, but yet you have to pay them for the monthly subscription. So it's not really a free credit. You're paying them for that credit. But it forces me to buy a new business book every month. And if I have a bunch of credits backed up and or I had a bunch of books backed up, it would promote me to get on my butt and start listening to them. So but that I already I usually use up my book before I have my credit, next credit available. But that's something that's really good. And again, what I'm trying to show you is these are things that you don't even have to remember to do. They will remind you. So Instagram being a follower, they'll automatically come up in your homepage. You don't have to go seek that out. It's going to come to you. And like we said, is one of the main reasons why people get stale is because they get busy doing other things. So I am not saying that you need to add anything to your already busy schedule. Just follow some cool people on Instagram. Subscribe to some people on YouTube. Get a podcast like the audio, I mean, uh, audio books. Get an audiobook subscription. That'll automatically remind you every month that you have a new credit available. And that can help kind of remind you again to go listen to the audiobooks. And then with seminars and clinics, you do have to look those up. So that is something that you'll have to kind of put some effort into. But you can put a reminder in your phone. And maybe every three months, you can afford and or try to find a weekend where you can go to a seminar or a clinic. And just have the goal of, okay, I'm going to go to three or four clinics this year. And that's going to help me teach, learn something. I'm going to do an audio book every single month. And then you can say each week, I'm going to pick a new exercise or new concept from YouTube and Instagram and apply them to my clients. So this is how you get a weekly, monthly, and then yearly based educational system developed. And that's going to spark new knowledge coming into your life and your training idea and creativities, and it's going to bring new knowledge in, and then you're automatically going to be 
pushing that onto your clients because again it's something you're passionate about so you can see how this becomes almost like self-guiding and that's what i wanted to like get across in this podcast was if you want to continue your education it doesn't have to be a job and if you're passionate about lifting the last thing you want it to feel like is a job you know you're not, not going to like that so these are some automated ways in which you can get it put on you without you having to go get it so it makes it easier another idea you have if you have available to you is to talk to other trainers so i talk to other trainers with uh, consultations that we do so i do help uh, trainers with training consultations for training ideas and structures and business ideas and how to run gyms and stuff and it's super fun i love it i love it love it love it love it love it so thank you to all of those who've uh, participated towards that i do sincerely appreciate it so thank you thank you um, and it's fun to see when you talk to other trainers like what they prioritize and see the factors that influence their training styles. So what equipment they have, what type of environment do they work in. Uh, work in. You can also see outside life. So if they're struggling with you know relationships, that can really f- like halter and slow down their learning. Or if they're just out of a relationship, maybe they went through a divorce or something, and um, or like a breakup, and now they're kind of fired up in business to try to take over, and a little bit of that is to mask the pain uh, from the loss, but also maybe they have some extra time, and they're trying to figure out how to fill that time. So you'll see just how like different life factors influence uh, a trainer's learning um, curve and desire and passion and motivation. So that's been really cool. Also, I have trainers who message me on Instagram. I actually work with trainers, too, like as clients. So I do their programming for them, and that's super fun because as often as I can with my busy schedule, I apologize uh, to those um, I work with if I don't talk to them more often. But it is fun when we get to talk about training ideas. Um, I also have other trainers who just message me on social media with questions and stuff, and that's fun. So they'll send me something they saw maybe recently on an Instagram post. So they'll message me directly on Instagram and they'll say, hey, what do you think about this? So that's kind of a moment of learning. I get to read through it, send them back my thoughts, and it kind of opens up some thinking for me for the day. So getting interaction with other trainers, and if you do it in person, that's great because you can cover more information. And it's nice to just have a face-to-face interaction. But often that doesn't happen because both of you are going to be busy. So talking with each other via Instagram could be a great way. So that's, uh, or it's like other forms of social media. Instagram is one of the most ways I get kind of influ- uh, contacted. Email. Email is another one which I like because you can write more in-depth in responses. So Instagram might be easy to share the content, and then I'll reply via email if I want to write longer responses. So, but that's something fun, too, is talk to other trainers. Like I said, whether it's in person, whether it's over social media, um, even discussion boards, if they have those at websites anymore, good God, I have no clue. Uh, but that might be an option. But talk to other people who do what you do. And that helps as well. And just kind of create some ideas, you know, say, hey, I've had this client recently and this is their situation. What would you do? You don't even have to tell them what you do. It's not a moment for you to brag. Okay. Just ask an open-ended question and just see what they offer. And you're like, oh, man, I didn't think about that. That would be awesome to add. Or you're like, yeah, they thought about pretty much what I would have thought about. So that makes me feel good. So sometimes you get confirmation. Sometimes you get new ideas. It's fun. You have, so it's cool to do that. Another way to do it is to uh, get new equipment. So now this is something that can be an expensive habit. So don't get uh, doing this too often. <laughs> but bringing in new equipment uh, can be a great way, obviously, to create new ideas and new training. So being a gym owner, as well as a personal trainer, I have the gym owner aspect of me where I get to buy new equipment all the time, and that's usually big purchases. So if I want to bring in a whole big piece of equipment. So uh, within the last two years, we brought in the Westside Barbell Inverse Curl, and that was fun to learn the differences of an inverse curl versus like a lying hamstring curl or a seated curl that you typically use for bodybuilders. (coughs) But we would use the inverse curl, trying to use it for athletes, but then it was also fun to try to use it for our bodybuilders as well. So give me a second. Sorry, i got to get something to drink. <coughs> Sorry, I've been fighting off a cold. So um, it can be helpful to bring in new piece, <coughs> pieces of equipment because that can spark new ideas. 
And if you can't do large pieces of equipment, you can bring in cheaper options. So, for example, <coughs> you can bring in like a slingshot, like Mark Bell from How Much You Bench.net sells those. And they're like a kind of a stretchy piece of a cloth that can help you do uh, teach people who are struggling with push-ups. It can actually help them do assisted push-ups, which is fun. You can use it for overload style bench pressing. Uh, there's a bunch of other options too, but those are kind of the two main ones you can do with uh, Slingshot. You also can bring in, he has another product called a Hip Circle, which again is an elastic stretchy band that you would put around like your knees or ankles and do like lower body movements to help warm up hips. So if you have a small facility and you don't have the room or the money to get like an abduction and an adduction machine, you can just buy a hip circle for like 20, 30 bucks and it does pretty much the same thing. You can buy resistance bands. So like I have clients do reverse banding and regular banding of exercises, like common exercises, if they have the capabilities to put bands up. Um, now if you band from the bottom, you can just simply put 100 pound dumbbells next to like say a bench press and you can band those. So you don't have to have fancy equipment, you can just have to have something heavy enough to hold the band down. Uh, you can also buy those little foot sliders and hand sliders. Those are cheap, but they create up a, open up a lot of opportunities for new exercises. You can bring in tires. Tires are usually really cheap to get. They're fun for different types of uh, like muscle cardio and athletic style exercises. Um, there's battle ropes, kegs, sleds, other kind of strongman style stuff that can often be cheap if you find the right place and the right person. But bringing in new equipment is a great way to get new training ideas brought into your uh, repertoire. So in order to have new ideas, you have to be constantly seeking new knowledge. That's basically what I'm trying to get across, is stay open-minded and actually seek out things that challenge you and challenge your ideas. So be open to experimentation. So if something is presented to you or you watch a video and you're like, oh, that's dumb. Well, have you tried it yet? <laughs> so try it first. You might find out it actually is dumb, but then at least you actually know the truth versus, versus just believing what you know okay, is true. And sometimes you start to lose touch with reality. So that happens all the time. All of us as trainers know some other trainer who thinks they know everything and they're absolutely an idiot. So we don't want to be that person. And if you don't stay open-minded, you will become that person. Okay. So you have to stay open-minded, you have to try weird stuff. Even if it looks like it's kind of odd, give it a try, okay? So in your own training, have openness in your training to try new things. So maybe you'll have a whole day dedicated to just fun new stuff. Or maybe in your training, if you're, say, a bodybuilder or a powerlifter or whatever, like say you're doing in your training, okay, I have to do biceps today. Well, stay open-minded to doing any type of bicep exercise. So if you saw a cool bicep exercise on a YouTube video by Josh Bryant, for example, uh, you can then add that into your own training, see if you like it. Maybe next week you can repeat it, see if you like it again, try to make some progression. Or maybe the next week you'll pick a whole new brand new exercise, bicep exercise. So you have to have openness in your own training so that way you can bring in new ideas into your own training, get a feel for them, and then take them into your client's training. So it's helpful as a trainer to have a couple selected clients that are, maybe they're just open to anything, they're super fun, they're excited people, uh, their goals are more broad based. So you can bring in new fun things. So maybe you brought a cool idea, you got to try it, you really liked it, and then you're going to say, hey client, I want you to try this. And my clients love that by the way. So if I see an exercise um, that maybe addresses like uh, shoulder imbalances, and I have a client who has a shoulder imbalance. And I say, hey, listen, I tried this recently. This is what it's supposed to do. I loved it. Do you want to try it? They're like, hell yeah. So they like trying new things too. So it can be fun and exciting. So bringing it to your clients can help you learn then how to apply it to someone else. So first do it on your own. You have to do it to yourself first. You're going to know what it's going to feel like. Then you can set it up with a few select clients, and that could be a super fun way to learn. And maybe you realize, hey, you know what, this isn't as great as I thought. Or, hey, this is good, but I'm going to use it in this way and this way compared to what I thought I was going to do. Or maybe, you know, this is the most amazing thing, and it now becomes one of your normal 20 exercises. So that's going to be really helpful, okay? 
So to wrap this all up is to get new ideas in your own training, you have to constantly seek out new knowledge. And you can do that by forced learning, okay, in the sense of being a follower of somebody on Instagram, being a subscriber of somebody on YouTube, so that way you get it kind of thrown in your face uh, every day, whether you're looking for it or not. You can do books, so do an Audible account, so that way every single month you're forced to buy a new book, or you can make a reminder in your phone and buy a new hard copy book every month, but you just have to set up reminders for yourself. So that way you don't have to remember every time it tells you. And then you can set up a goal of seminars and clinics. Like I said, three to four a year. That's a great, great, great learning curve. So that's a system that gives you daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly forms of education. Cool. So hopefully this gave you some ideas. If you have any questions on top of these that uh, you'd like clarity on, email us at brutalironjim at gmail.com. If you want any strategy ideas or anything like that, whatever, anything that you think based on today's information that might help you be a better trainer, we want to help you with that too. So the better trainer you are, the more people you help, and the better the world's going to be. So it helps us to help you. <laughs> okay? So uh, email us with anything you need. Now, if you like this podcast, please share it with family and friends. The more people 